singing. You may be seated. Good morning. It's a good seasonal song, praising our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ with his birth, for his birth, 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 birth for his birth. Um, it's good to see you guys this morning crowd. I guess the rain drove everybody in this morning. Uh, thank God for the rain. I tell you what, we sure need it, and I hope it rains all day for the next couple of days. But uh, thank the Lord for the rain this morning. Thank God, thank the Lord for you guys being here this morning. Uh, we have this place to come to and to worship uh, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and we can come and bring our petitions, and bring our uh, wants and our desires before our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and as we open up this morning, let's... Uh, uh, Pastor, I'm going to get my lips in, in tune here in just a minute. Uh, they're still cold to get warmed up here. Uh, Pastor was telling me this morning that uh, Jeff Saunders' mom, Shirley Saunders, uh, who had that stroke uh, for a while back, uh, she fell and broke her hip. Uh, so Jeff has went up to be with her. I think they're scheduling some surgery, getting some of that uh, taken care of there. So just uh, pray for Jeff and Miss Shirley Saunders as uh, she goes uh, through this. And also continue to pray for the Johnson family. This was the uh, uh, friends or a teacher at Pensacola that had passed away. A uh, fairly young man uh, was a teacher in the college there. So just pray uh, for those. Any other special requests? I know I'm, I miss many, but gosh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you pray for them, Spencer family, uh, all those that have um, relatives or family members that have passed away and are still uh, going through the, the grieving process of that. Uh, continue to pray for those in Tennessee. Uh, they've gone through these uh, horrible fires. Um, pray that the uh, Lord would, yes, open some eyes. Right, ne never mind. Okay, let's, uh, what else we got this morning? Any other special requests? Yes, Miss Jen. this morning for the needs, uh, physical needs, uh, spiritual needs this morning, there's financial needs probably in our midst, uh, there's all kind of needs that uh, we don't know about, so let's just pray for each other, uh, God's will will be done in our hearts and our minds this morning, and our life uh, to come, uh, we don't know what God has for us tomorrow or the next day, but <clears throat> he does, and we're thankful that we serve a God that knows uh, what he has for us, and we just put our faith and our trust in him for whatever comes that... Uh, we may honor and glorify him through it. Miss Mary. The Lith family, yes. Our daughter. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. Oh, they did. Okay. Yeah, the 
Smith family, I'm sure probably many of you have heard, heard of this, the accident of this young girl who uh, I think pulled out in front of somebody uh, and was killed. Uh, so just pray for that family. I think there are insurance family in town here that I think they sell insurance, don't they? Or they did or they still do, but uh, it was a tragic loss. I understand they had uh, over 3,000 people at the funeral home, so it was a uh, for the family, I don't know if that's a blessing or a curse, and that's tough. That's got to be tough to go through that for, I understand, it went on from like 4 o'clock to probably 10.30. Uh, so that's that's rough on a family. Uh, so just pray for that family there for the for the passing, passing of this daughter. Anything else this morning? Pray for Sunday School Hour uh, this morning. Pray that God would uh, uh, just be on the heart of each teacher, on, on all those that are sitting and hearing the Word of God, that it would have an open passageway to the heart and to the mind that it would, it would uh, change us uh, as the word of God should. Uh, anything else? Pray for pastor this morning. Uh, pray for services of the day. All right, well, let's uh, open up in a word of prayer this morning. And um, Brother John, how about praying for us this morning? Birthdays and anniversaries doesn't uh, look like we have anybody in our Sunday school class this morning that is on the list, but we have Jenny Cabrera, Noah Lamb, uh, Leah Atkins, and Mary Cox. So just be mindful of each one of those and no anniversaries. You guys, you can go ahead. Uh, I had uh, seen Danny Richardson uh, yesterday in the store. He come in and and visited and uh, talked a little bit. I didn't have much time to talk to him. Grayson talked to him a little bit more, but he left uh, some some brochures from, from his ministry. Uh, I think I've got 12 of them up here, and he said, please give these to the guys at Eastside, those that want them. Uh, so I've got 12 of them up here. I th- no, maybe it's 11. I think I kept one. Uh, so just see me after uh, Sunday school this morning if you desire one, and, and you can have one. Uh, he desires... Uh, our prayers. Uh, he's still weak uh, from his sickness. He said he had, I think he said 85% of his body had infection in it whenever he got the parasite. I think it was from food or from the water or a com- uh, combination of both. Uh, so just pray for him and the ministry there. And also, uh, Lori had seen, I forgot to, to tell you this before we opened in prayer, but uh, seen, uh, I think it was Kathy Wall, I believe it was Barry Wall's wife. Uh, Barry had been battling. Uh, inner ear problems and she said for about six months so she asked if Eastside as a church would pray for Barry Wall pray that the Lord would take this uh, inner ear because he says he gets very nauseated and, and it's throwing up and all that goes with that inner ear problem so pray for Barry Wall he is a pastor at uh, Amity Hills Baptist Church if you're not familiar with who Barry Wall is so, so just pray uh, for him through this time okay Luke chapter 2 this morning. We're going to continue on with this this thought process of a season uh, to proclaim. A season to proclaim. So Luke 2, we kind of sung about some of it this morning in in that song Silent Night. That holy night. I don't think it was very necessarily silent uh, when the angels come on the scene and and started proclaiming. But um, probably before that happened, it was probably pretty quiet. The first point we looked at last week was the, uh, the announcement. The announcement, uh, which we see in verse 11. Verse 11 says, this is the angels proclaiming. It says, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. If you look up the word Christ, it's Christos, Lord, Kurios. Christos, Kurios. It is Christ the Lord, it is Messiah and supreme authority. So what, don't, over, don't read over 
that verse 11, what the angels are proclaiming of, of who it is that's born. It is Messiah, Savior. It is Christ. It is Jesus. He is Lord. He is supreme authority. Don't overlook this proclamation of who this babe is in the manger. He's just not a cute little cuddly baby, and he is that. But he is God in flesh. He is supreme ruler, supreme authority. This is the heavenly announcement. Now we're going to look at the, see the heavenly arrival. The heavenly arrival. And we're going to be looking at in verse 15 and 16 here but in just a minute. But uh, after these uh, shepherds hear this wonderful news, they determine to discover for themselves what God had told them through the angels to see if these things were true or not. And they did. They took their time. They didn't take their time about it. They made haste to Bethlehem stable where Jesus lay. Let's look in Luke 2 and verse 15 and see what the passage says. And it says, It come to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven. Now you see the scene. Now the angels have, have gone. The, the sky is not full of angels anymore. They've gone. They have left the message. And the shepherds said to one another, in the conversation I can't let us now go even to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass which the Lord hath made known unto us and they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger the place the place of the arrival of God incarnate of God in the, fle in, in the flesh is according to the scriptures where yeah, it's in the manger. It's the babe was born in the stable. But in what region, what town? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Bethlehem means what? Anybody? House of bread. House of bread. The town of Bethlehem was located six miles, cutting in and out, didn't it, Josie? About six miles south of Jerusalem. We see it's about a six-mile journey uh, to there. Bethlehem uh, is more than just the birthplace of, of Jesus, and that's probably the most important uh, aspect of Bethlehem. But Bethlehem has other biblical characters that were involved uh, in making this a name that is familiar to us. Rachel, uh, she was the beloved wife of Jacob, is buried there in Bethlehem. Uh, it's the original home of Naomi. Who's Naomi? What? I don't know about purple, but uh, it, it may be. I, I don't know. That, that's not what I was looking for, but she is the mother-in-law to Ruth, okay? And, and was the setting for much of the book of Ruth. But perhaps the most important person to have come from Bethlehem before Christ was who? It says it in verse 11. Huh? It's the city of David. The city of David. But, and, and then also in, in, in the Old Testament, you, you can read it's called Bethlehem Judea, Bethlehem Ephratah, and I don't know if that's the correct way to pronounce it, but uh, Ephrata, I think, is correct. It is a fertile hills, valleys, regions. Even David himself may have shepherded uh, in this area. And the Bible doesn't is not clear of that. But if this was where David was anointed by uh, Samuel to be king over King Saul, so this is not just a uh, not just a place of the birth of Christ. And I say just in in, in loose terms, but. Uh, there's many things that happen here in this region of, of Bethlehem. And it seems amazing that such a rich history of the, of the Bethlehem area here, but it's still just a common, small town. Nothing spectacular about Bethlehem. It's just an ordinary town, but the Bible, excuse me, the Bible indicates that this is the case. Micah 5, 2, you don't have to turn there, I'll read it for you, but Micah kind of gets an idea of this of Bethlehem. It says, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, 
yet out of thee shall uh, he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth has been told of old from everlasting. Now Micah is prophesying here about the birth of Jesus Christ. Now how long ago was Micah written when it comes to this aspect of where Jesus is being born and when Micah prophesied this? It was over four, well over 400 years. It was 720 years to be exact. So you can see <clears throat> when we look at the narrative uh, of the birth of Jesus Christ, it is miraculous to say the least that Isaiah, Micah, 700 and some years before that they talked about Jesus being born. They talked about Bethlehem. They talked about the birthplace. You just can't make this stuff happen by accident. This is the sovereign hand of God bringing all these things together to this specific point to where he sends his son, Jesus Christ, the angels proclaim it, and it was told from Genesis through Revelation what's going to happen. It is miraculous. I, I, we'll talk about that some here in, in just a minute, but this place of the arrival of Bethlehem. <clears throat> the person who arrived. Although the town was ordinary and the stable and manger were common for the day, there was nothing at all common or ordinary about the person the shepherds saw, uh, the person, lying in the manger. They saw the only begotten Son of God, the Savior of the world. In our... Uh, ecumenical area, era, the time that we live in, we come in increasingly emphasize a multitude of pathways to heaven. People are increasingly tolerant of all religions and gods except Jesus Christ. You're okay, you can talk about Muhammad if you want to, you can talk about Buddha, just don't talk about Jesus Christ and him being on the way. That's not tolerant. You can be tolerant, let's not be tolerant of, of Jesus Christ. Let's not be tolerant of Jesus or Christians who emphasize Jesus Christ and his exclusivity of who he says he is and who he is. If you have any knowledge of all of the word of God, you cannot help but understand who Jesus is. Just by common, ordinary reading, it is impossible not to determine that Jesus Christ is who he says he is. He says he is, he is God. But in our society, I think we're becoming not necessarily as much tolerant, and that is a tolerance that we see is ecumenical, and everybody's okay. I'm okay, you're okay, don't bother me. But we're becoming more secular and becoming more hostile to those that have a religious mindset, even to the point of the Muslims, the, the Christians, the Buddhists, uh, there are many in our secular society that think that uh, any religion is a, is a blight on society. And that is where secularism comes in. What is secularism? It is attitudes and activities that have no religious basis at all. And this is what much of our country wants in our government. They don't want any kind of religious mindset in, in the people who run our country. We cannot emphasize enough that Jesus Christ is the one true God. Apart from Jesus Christ being who he says he is, there is absolutely no reason to be in this place. There's absolutely no reason to come to church. There is absolutely no reason to be religious whatsoever. If Jesus Christ is not the Son of God, then we are become liars of who we believe God to be. Look at Romans chapter 1. Look at look at verses in the word of God, in the scriptures that explain. Now some, you know, to probably a, a Sunday school class that's, that's faithful and has been in church for many years, it's like uh, many pastors say, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, I'm teaching to the choir because you know this and you understand it. But I want to bring all this back to our memories, bring it back to the forefront of our minds during this time of the year to understand that Christmas is not Santa Claus. It is not giving presents to each other. It is God incarnate coming to this earth. God himself 
for a purpose, and that's going to a cross to die for my sins and your sins. It is not about how much we can give to each other. And is, is it wrong to give presents? No, I'm not beating all that up. But keep in your mind, that is not Christmas. Jesus Christ is the gift that was given to us by God. And we commemorate that by giving gifts to each other. But don't, 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 don't make that the forefront of what Christmas is because it's not. Let's look at what Paul says. The first, the first chapter in the book of Romans, Paul is adamant. He says, Paul, in verse 1, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of who? God. He says, which was promised before by his prophets. He said, all this is prophesied. All you got to do is look in the Old Testament to see that God is prophesied, that Jesus is prophesied of the Holy Scriptures. What does verse 3 say? The gospel of God is concerned Son, Jesus, or Christ, our Lord. Jesus Christ, our Lord. So is there any question there that God says Jesus Christ is his Son? which was made of the seed of David. Now, this is talking about his lineage physically. This was according to the flesh, is what it says in, in verse 3 there. He says, which was made of the seed of David according to his flesh. That is the fleshly lineage of Jesus Christ. And it says, and declared, declared, what, what is a declaration? What I think about when I think of a declaration, I think about the Declaration of Independence. That is a marked off area. It is the fine area. It is a determined thing. It is a shown thing. It is a proved thing. When you watch the football game this evening, or you watch a basketball this evening, there are determined areas that you have to play within. If you step out of those boundaries, you are penalized. So there is a set boundary that God says here that this is my declaration. This is a set boundary. You step outside these boundaries and you're wrong. You are either uh, idolatrous or you are cultish. You stay within these boundaries of me saying that this, he says it to be declared that Jesus Christ is the Son of God with power. With power. And we see all this, how Jesus revealed himself in his, in his child as he grew. We see the miracles. We see how uh, Jesus showed himself to be who he is. He died on a, rugged, on a cruel, rugged cross, and he was buried. And what happened? He rose again. He declared himself through the power that we see in him to be the Son of God according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. He arose and declared himself to be who he says he is. Matthew 1, 22 and 23, if you want to turn there, uh, this is a prophecy of Isaiah 740 years before this happened. And I'll go ahead and read in verse 22 and 23. It says, Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord, by the prophet. This is a prophecy of God that Isaiah had received, and now he's given it to us. He says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So we see this prophecy from Isaiah. We see the prophecy from Michael, from Micah, about the town of Bethlehem. We see all the scriptures coming together that point towards something, point towards a person, point towards the Son of God. This is Christmas. This is Christmas. This is the birth of God in flesh. Many religions celebrate, excuse me, many religious celebrations of Christmas holiday leave out the most important reason for joy in the season. Um, you listen to Albert Muller I'm talking about the secularization of Thanksgiving, the secularization of, of Christmas, and how people try to live and being thankful apart from 
what Thanksgiving should be about, and it's in God's blessings upon us, or having a Christmas apart from what Christmas implies and is, is the birth of Jesus Christ. Secularized, secularized holidays, Christmas or Thanksgiving, and even in Easter, how, how do you have a secularized eating of those? If you, what are you thankful for? I mean, I guess I could be thankful for my, my dog or my car or my house or whatever like that, and we should be thankful for those things, but that is secondary in this, in this idea. But <clears throat> many take offense <clears throat> excuse me, at truth. Never thought I'd see a day in my life where truth was trivialized, where truth was made to be something other than it is. In our society, in our colleges, now, I'm not saying all colleges, but many colleges are teaching that truth is relative. The truth would depend on whether you believe it or not. Don't make any sense to me how the truth of gravity could be controlled by whether I believe it to be so or not. That's, that's foolishness. That's ignorance. Same thing with the truth of Jesus Christ coming to this earth, being born as a child, being born as a, this babe, and being God. It is truth. It's not subject to whether I believe it or not. Truth is never subject to whether I believe it or not, or whether you believe it or not. It is truth because God says it is. Anything other than that is, is heresy. It is falsehood. Emmanuel. God with us. Their feelings make it no less fact. God with us is what Christmas is all about. Jesus is the Son of God. What does Jesus mean? What is the definition of Jesus, his name? I hear it, Savior. He is our Savior. He come for a purpose, to seek and to save that which is lost. Now, what is that which is lost? It's me, and it's you, and our families, our children. Uh, chapter 1 and verse 20, I think you may be still there in Matthew. Matthew 1, 20. Um, says, but while uh, he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord, and this is talking about Joseph, he come to Joseph in a dream, and he said, Thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived of her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. If he come to save us from our sins, that must mean that we're sinners. That means we needed a Savior. We must have a Savior. Every man, woman, boy, child, girl, whatever, sex, creed, color, race, it makes absolutely no difference. We all fall short of the glory of God. How do I know that? The Bible says it to be so. Romans 3, verse 10 says, As it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. <clears throat> there's none that understands. There's none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none good. Or excuse me, there is none that doeth good. No, not one. What does that tell you? What does it tell me? That we need a Savior. God seen that. He understood that. He's seen the sin of Adam. It was placed upon us. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There was a, <clears throat> a boy during this time of the year who wanted to prove he was especially worthy of a great Christmas present, he wrote to Santa and said this, Dear Santa, I don't like this illustration because I don't like Santa, <laughs> but there are little boys who live in our house. There's Jeffrey, he's two. There's David, he's four. And there's Norman, and he is seven. Jeffrey is good some of the time. David is good some of the time. But Norman is good all the time. P.S. My name's Norman. <laughs> he thought he was worthy. He thought he was worthy of his blessings. We all understand that we are far from perfect. But when we rationalize and compare ourselves to others, we can conceive ourselves to be better than we truly are. You ever done that? Raise your hand. I know I, well, I look at some people sometimes and I say, Woo! I'm glad I ain't like that. And I can look at others and say, well, I'd like to be like that. 
in many times, but we got to understand when we compare ourselves to others, we can always, always find somebody that, that we think will better than us. When it comes spiritually, physically, financially, whatever, we can always pick out those that we can be better than. We don't want to look at those that we know to be better than us. We've got to be careful of that. That's not a comparison. That's not how God looks at us. He don't look at us in our financial status. He don't look at us in our being good. Uh, he, he wants us to be that when we become his children. He wants us to live in the manner as he uh, shows us in his word that God, our comparison when we're looking at others ought to be focused in a different direction. Who are we compare ourselves to? We ought to compare ourselves to God. To God. That's our standard. That's our standard. Even the best of us are miserably lacking in this aspect of being right with a holy God. On your own. On your own apart from Christ, the best that we can be is miserable. We are, well, I think what the scripture describes as what? Filthy rags. Is that good? No, that's not very good, is it? At the best that we can be, that's what we are, apart from Jesus Christ. That's why I think we ought to get back to what Christmas is about. It's about God coming to this earth in flesh in Jesus Christ for a purpose, and that's to save us wretched people that are filled with sin and miserably lost without him. None of us are worthy of this gift of God. This is why we all need what Jesus offers, God's forgiveness and eternal peace. All right, we seen the heavenly announcement. We've heard the angels proclaim. We see the heavenly arrival of where it's at and who it is that's come to be with us now. We need to share the heavenly amazement. This is the whole, this is the foundation of what we've been talking about. Taking what it is we know to be true about the word of God. Why? Because it's changed us because it's caused us to be born again. It's caused us to have this new life of God within us, the Spirit working in and through us. Now what are we supposed to do with it? Are we supposed to hoard it? Did these shepherds say, guys, I mean, that was something. That was a show, wasn't it? And then go back to their job, go back to tending their sheep? No. Put yourself for a moment in the shepherd's shoes. Let's go back there for just a minute. Go back to uh, Luke chapter 2. How they must have felt when they seen this angelic being and have witnessed the birth of Christ as they were told by the angel and they were proclaimed by the heavenly host, which host went what? Anybody remember what last week what host means? It means army, the army of angels that were proclaimed in the sky the message that was given to them. What must they have wondered? That why did God pick us of all people to see this amazing gift or this amazing sight? And even better, so what do we do now? If you look in the narrative of this scripture, do you see a command of these shepherds to go tell? If you can find it, I can't. I cannot find where the angel said, now that you know this, you've got to go tell it. Now we're commanded as children of God to go into all the world and preach the gospel, but the angels never commanded the shepherds to go. But what did they do? They went. They went. Having seen and heard the news, they told everybody that they could tell the miracle of Jesus' birth was never supposed to have been an isolated discovery. The world needed to know, and it needs to know now. It needs to know today. Their call to see this miracle was also a call to share with others. Just as God had a bigger purpose for the shepherds, <clears throat> he did not place me or you on earth just to work a job or to make a name for ourselves. If we think that's our purpose, we're missing what God has for us. Our purpose is proclaiming Jesus Christ as the purpose for these shepherds were. Now, did the shepherds stop being shepherds? No. They still had jobs. They went back to their jobs. 
we still have jobs to do as individuals. We got to go to work, and we have to pay our bills, and we we need to be faithful in that. But that's not our main purpose in life. Our main purpose in life is being Christians, and all that entails, and all that applies to me and you. It is being proclaimers, telling the truth, telling what it is we know to be true about ourselves. Now, is that difficult? Sometimes it is. Just as God has a bigger purpose, excuse me, I just, re I just read that. We need to make him known to this world. Now, who was this heavenly uh, announcement given to? This was a call to worried men. This was a call to fearful men. And I think this is, this is very profound. You remember how the angels told the shepherds to fear not? These guys were scared to death. Remember last week we talked about that hyperphobia is what this means. They were in great fear. These men were worried, but God wanted them to know he could still use them. You know, I've seen this, and I understand this personally. I understand this of a fear, of a worry about proclaiming the truth of God's word. And I looked up in uh, some Christian posts is one of them. And belief net. Just a couple. I'll just I just typed in. Why do Christians not proclaim the gospel? I can't remember this exact uh, term I put in Google. This is what come up. I, I knew exactly what the first one would be. In every instance I looked at, fear was the greatest reason that people don't proclaim the gospel. We're scared to death of people. We're scared to death what people think of us. We're scared to death what they might say about us or we'll get in some trouble or we'll this or we'll that I don't see that in the scriptures when it comes to the shepherds I don't see a fear once they got over the fear of what they had seen and God says okay calm down this is what I want you to do fear <clears throat> both of them fear second on one of them was ignorance ignorance help us ignorant about what God has done for us <clears throat> the other one was not knowledgeable why is that yes miss Mary uh, excuse me <laughs> Mary said what I didn't raise my hand <laughs> <Miss Jo. laughs> yes absolutely We're not in the in crowd, yeah. Mm hmm Yep. Now Mary. <laughs> mm hmm Mm hmm Sure. Don't care, yes. Yeah. I know you, you, you read any, any, anybody, any, even in your own life, you can see how, like Mary said, when you first saved, oh, how exuberant you are, and how you just want to tell everybody, and then as we become more educated and we become more churchy, then we become, one of them was uh, apathetic. <clears throat> we become apathetic. Yes, Miss Joe. They may not be saved. Exactly right. Mm-hmm. That's something to think about. That's why God says, search the scriptures daily to see what? To see if you're in the faith. To see if you're really saved. There's uh, arrogance was one of them. Uh, political correctness. Don't know how. You ought to know how. If you're saved, you ought to know how you got saved. And you ought to be able to tell others. Easiness was one of them. And this bad theology. But anyway... 
I'm going to read this uh, last section of scripture. Second Corinthians, turn there, chapter 12. We've got just a couple minutes. I think this, this thing of fear, this thing of worry, we don't see it stopping the shepherds. They went forward and proclaimed. They went and seen. The, they didn't see the birth of Jesus Christ. They seen Christ in the manger. The angels proclaimed it. They went and saw it. And then they went and told others about it. And that is exactly what we as children of God should be doing. We have been born again. God has revealed himself to us. He's told us what to go tell, and now we need to go tell it. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9 through 10. In, in, in this idea of being worried, fearful, he says, my grace is sufficient for thee, for thee guys. That ought to be uh, enough to sure us up. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now this is Paul talking about himself here. He says, therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution. Paul said he did what? He takes pleasure in them? In distresses, what? For Christ's sake? He says, for when I am weak, then I'm strong. Now understand, I, I can't stand under these things on my own. It's got to be through the power of Christ within us. Are, are we hindering the work of the Spirit of God in our life because we've got so much that's more important than that? I think maybe that's where maybe I am sometimes when it comes to my fear of proclaiming what it is that God has told me to do. God help me. Don't let fear stop you. Don't let it stop me from sharing the gospel with others. Instead, determine to let God use you even in your weakness. And I, we're all in here weak in some way or another. We all have different weaknesses. Brother Paul. Part of that ignorance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, that's 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 perfect. That's exactly what we're talking about. Second Timothy one seven, and I'll close with this. God has not given us a spirit of fear. That is not coming from God. If we think God is causing us to be fearful, we're going against the scripture completely. That's what 2 Timothy 1.7 says. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. If we're fearful, it's not coming from God. It's because we choose to be. Let's pray. Father God, thank you this morning that we can call you Father. Thank you, Lord, that you sent your blessed Son, Jesus Christ, to be born for a purpose of going to a cross, dying for my sins and the sins of all of us sitting in here, the sins of the world. God, thank you for your goodness to us and for your grace and your mercies. Apart from, Lord, we would not even be here. Lord, thank you for your word that shows us examples, that shows us truth, Lord, it shows us direction. God, help us to take and apply it to our life. And God, help us not to be fearful. Number one reason, Lord, we don't give our faith. We don't show our faith many times. God, help us not to want to be cool in the minds and the eyes of the world. We want to be right standing with you, being faithful as children. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Help our pastor this morning. I pray that you use him and fill him, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.